In the midst of the Great Depression, speaking to a nation with fears about the economy, FDR once famously said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Those are inspiring words, but they're really just words. Uh, there were no guarantees. What is it that you are afraid of? Uh, whatever it is, is the best that someone can offer you just words, just a pep talk? Uh, this week, we're going to be taking a look at the many times that God speaks those beautiful words, do not be afraid. Today, he speaks them to the nation of Israel, who is a thousand miles away at this point in captivity in Babylon. Do you remember how that turned out? God brought them back from captivity just as he, as he had promised. This is what your God says to you today. He says, so do not be afraid. Why? For I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. You see, God wants us to take our strength from him. The strength to love our neighbor, the strength to love him above everything and everyone else. The strength to say, your will be done every single day because every day there's going to be something that doesn't go the way we want it to. The strength to say, God is good and to call good whatever comes from his hand. The strength to know that God has the strength to do more than we can ask or possibly imagine, and he will. After all, God promises to uphold you with that righteous right hand. Just think of what that hand has done. That hand flung the stars into the universe and, and formed the, the ocean beds. That hand crafted Adam and Eve and you and me as works of art. And because God loves you so much, God let that hand become human. Why? So that nails could be pounded through it. So that he could die on a cross for you. And yet he didn't remain lifeless in that grave. No, watch as that hand that upholds you grabs the doorway of his tomb as he walks out of that grave alive. And now that same hand is raised in blessing ever since Jesus ascended into heaven for you. And so can you see why God says to you today, do not be afraid? Not because he's taken every frightening thing away, but because God wants to give you strength to endure it all. God doesn't say, don't be afraid, you can do this. No, he says, don't be afraid. I have done it and now I am with you. The little kid who's scared to cross the busy street by himself is no longer scared when his father takes his hand and crosses with him. That's the comfort that you have today, tomorrow, and every day after that. Your God, he says, do not be afraid. I am with you. This is no pep talk. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, whatever today may bring, be with me, and I will never have to be afraid. Amen. I'll bet that if you thought long enough, you could think of a time in your life when you were in a seemingly impossible situation. That was certainly the case for the people in our Do Not Be Afraid passage for today. The Israelites found themselves trapped between the Red Sea on one side and Pharaoh's army on the other side. Well, now how did they get there? Uh, well, the Egyptians had enslaved God's people and so God sent Moses to the Pharaoh of Egypt to, with a very simple message, let my people go. Uh, Pharaoh didn't want to get rid of his free workforce and so he refused and so God flexed his muscles with the ten plagues. Finally, Pharaoh said, just go! But no sooner had they left than Pharaoh realized he was losing his free workforce. And so he sent the army of Egypt, world power of the day, against the defenseless Israelites. And so now there's Israel. Israel, with their women and children and all, have an unpassable sea on one side and an unconquerable army on the other side. God had promised to get them into the promised land. But humanly speaking, I would say that's about as close to an impossible situation as you could possibly get to. So what was the uh, Israelites' reaction? That's the key. Uh, they cried out in despair to God because they didn't see a way out. And that's a temptation for us too. In our impossible situations in life, when we don't see a way out, it's so easy to trust God when we see the blessings, but when we see the Red Sea of struggle standing between us and the Promised Land, that's a different story. And that's when we really need to think about one fact. Who is it that sent Moses to say to the Israelites, do not be afraid. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. 
It's the Lord, that's all. The Lord who created the universe and sustains it. The Lord who was powerful enough to wipe out the world with a worldwide flood. The Lord who gave life to Abram's wife's dead womb and Sarah and brought about Isaac. The Lord whose power made that one child into a great nation. The Lord whose power rescued that great nation from the hands of the Egyptians with ten plagues. The Lord who shaped all of world history to bring about the fulfillment of his promise to send his son Jesus to be the savior of the world, to be your savior and mine. Now, doesn't that put our impossible situations in perspective? What situation is too impossible for God? No, when the impossible meets God and his promises, then we need to hear God say, do not be afraid. The Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Are you worried about your forgiveness or your ability to forgive? You need only be still. Just look at the cross and see your Lord fight to the death for you. Are you worried about, about the things that rob us of life, like sickness and an accident? You need only be still. Just look at the empty tomb and watch your Lord defeat death. Are, are you worried about having enough? You need only be still and see your Savior's ascended hand raised in blessing over you. In all those ways, you hear your Savior God say to you, do not be afraid. You need only be still. When the impossible in your life meets God's promises, as one who stands on the other side of the Red Sea, as one who stands on the other side of Jesus' cross and empty tomb, know that the Lord will fight for you. You need only be still. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, give me confidence that nothing is impossible with you. Calm my heart at all times, assuring me that I do not need to be afraid. Amen. When it comes to the future, it's like wearing a blindfold. Does thinking about the future make you nervous? It did for Gideon. God came to Gideon and wanted him to save his people from uh, their enemies. But Gideon was terrified and God had said, no, I'll go with you, I'll give you success. But Gideon wanted a sign. He wanted a peek from beneath the blindfold to know that everything would be okay. So he made the sacrifice. He placed it on a rock. The Lord took his staff and touched the sacrifice and it was consumed with fire. And when Gideon saw it, he was terrified. That's when God said to him this. He said, peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. You know, we want assurance too that everything's going to be okay um, and that God isn't angry with us. So does God give that assurance? Does he give us signs? Does he give us a peek from beneath the blindfold? Yeah, but maybe not in the ways that sometimes we look for those signs. Uh, think of this way. Say a, a, a woman wakes up and spills coffee on her outfit and ends up getting off to work about 10 minutes late. She takes it as a sign that God must not be pleased with her. But on her way to work, she sees an accident that must have happened 10 minutes before. As she passes the wreck, she thinks, oh man, that could have been me. And she takes it as a sign that, well, God must be pleased with her. Well, she gets to work and since she was 10 minutes late, her boss fires her. Oh, God's upset with her. So she goes back home and stops by a gas station to buy another coffee and somebody, a stranger, comes up to her and gives her a lottery ticket and says, it looks like you could use this more than me. And she cashes it in to realize she had won one million dollars. Oh, God's happy. But all that newfound wealth ends up straining every relationship she has and I think you get the point, right? Um, don't say too much. But I thought God gives us signs, right? I, I, I thought that God gives us a peek from beneath the blindfold. Well, he does. We just need to look at the place where God promised to give us a sign. Now, listen to the words that the angel spoke to the shepherds. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws and lying in a manger. Do you see the point? In order for us to have assurance for the future, we need to look to the past. There are times in history where God lifted the blindfold and said, here, take a peek. Only God doesn't ask us to, to search the stars. <laughs> he simply asks us to follow a star that leads to a manger in Bethlehem. God doesn't ask us to, to climb up into heaven to read his mind. No, he asks us to climb the hill of Calvary and, and see his heart. God does give us a peek from beneath the blindfold. You think about that, that God's son hangs there for you. 
And he who did not spare his only son, how will he not also give us all things? What greater assurance for the future could we have? Uh, what, what, what more certainty of Christ's love for us could we have than that? And so my question is, where will you be in five or 15 or 25 years? Well, that's easy. Right where you are now, being led by your loving Savior, Jesus. God will peel back the blindfold completely in heaven. And he'll say, look, my child, this is what I was leading to you to the entire time. But until then, let's be thankful that he gives us a peek from beneath the blindfold. Let's pray. Jesus, you hold my future in your hands. Comfort me with the knowledge that you will bless my life in every way that is best. In your precious name I pray, amen. Feeling alone in a struggle can be a scary thing. In the prophet Elisha's day, one of Israel's enemies was the nation of Aram. Now, the king of Aram was not a big fan of Elisha because every time Aram was going to attack, God would tell Elisha the plan, Elisha would pass that info on to the king of Israel, and Israel would be ready for the attack. So the king of Aram thought, well, I'll, kill, uh, I'll take out the middleman, I'll, I'll just kill Elisha. So he found out that Elisha and his servant were in this little city called Dothan, and he sent an army to totally surround the city. Now just imagine the Elisha's servant's reaction when he went out to go get a copy of the Dothan Dispatch and he looks up and he sees the city totally surrounded by soldiers. He, he slammed back through the screen door and he shouted out, Oh my Lord, what shall we do? He felt like they were trapped. It was the army totally surrounding the city. He was afraid. He felt alone. Have you been there? Uh, where you've felt like you've been in a battle where it's you against the world and you're all alone in the battle. I'm guessing you've never been in the situation where you've been surrounded by an army intent on killing you, but I would guess you've been in a situation uh, where you felt like Elisha's servant did, where you felt all alone in your battle and you just cried out, Oh Lord, what shall I do? <laughs> Lord, open his eyes. That was Elisha's simple prayer to answer his servant's fear. He went on to say this, Don't be afraid, Elisha said. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and do you know what he saw? He saw the entire army of Aram surrounded by fiery angels and chariots. I don't think Elisha's servant saw that coming. But the same goes for your problems too. Who else sees your battle? Who sees your battle against sin and is able to help? Who else sees your battle against loneliness or depression or temptation? Who else knows what it feels like to be abandoned by God? Lord, open their eyes. Your Jesus does. It must have seemed completely backwards to the angels. I mean, the angels existed to serve Jesus. They existed to praise Jesus. When, when Jesus was born, they were there. Uh, when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the desert, uh, the angels were there to attend him. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus prayed, not, O oh Lord, what shall I do? But he prayed, Father, your will be done. And the angels were there to attend him. But then their role changed. An angry mob came into the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus and Peter tried to defend them and Jesus rebuked Peter. And he said, Peter, don't you know that if I called on my father, he would send 12 legions of angels to come to my defense? I just love picturing that. 72,000 mighty spirits chomping on the bit to come to Jesus' defense. But the angel legions were idle. I just imagine that at the cross, there they were straining to help Jesus, but the Father's hand held them back. The Father, when Jesus needed him most, seemed to turn his back on him and the angels could do nothing. Why? Why would the Father do that? Well, he did that to his Son so that his care for you would never be held back. So that Jesus' help and the help of the angels, you'll never be alone. Now, you may not know your angel stories like Elisha could tell an angel story, but make no mistake, you have them. God promises he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. If you could only see it, they surround us right now. So don't be afraid of being alone. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Let's pray. 
Dear Jesus, never leave me. Always send your angels to protect me. Always remind me that I don't need to be afraid of being alone. In your name I pray. Amen. You have peace. Uh, peace is knowing that everything in your life is whole and complete. There is nothing missing. Does that describe your life? <laughs> What would you say to this? What, what is the missing piece in your life? How, how would you finish this sentence? If only I had, and you fill in the blank, then I would have peace. And truthfully, some search for it their entire lives, but they never find it. They, they kind of miss the point of this life. I think of a story thrilled by their success in achieving flight for the first time. Uh, the Wright brothers sent a telegram to their sister saying, we have actually flown 120 feet, period. We'll be home for Christmas, period. And, and the sister was so excited that she took it to the newspaper and the editor read it and said, oh, that's nice. The boys will be home for Christmas. Do you see the point? Don't miss the real news. The angels announced it 2,000 years ago. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. This is God the Father's gift to you. He gave it just for the world and therefore just for you. Don't miss that part of the angel's message. They didn't just announce that a Savior had been born, but they announced that a Savior has been born to you. God the Father is the only one in the history of the world who was able to give every person in this world a gift on a single night. And he gave you the missing piece, spelled P-E-A-C-E. -E. Now everything in your life is whole, everything is complete, because God has come to live with you. you he has nothing more that he can give you. Now that doesn't give us all the details about life, but it does give us the essentials. It doesn't tell us the, the why or the where or the when or even the what. But it gives us even better. It tells us the who. Jesus, the one who would be wrapped in cloths at his birth, uh, would also be wrapped in cloths at his grave when he gave his life for your salvation and mine. You see, it's why he came. Jesus didn't come to give us warm fuzzies at his birth, but by his birth, he came to give us peace. <laughs> So now, don't be afraid of anything. You are whole because of Jesus. It's what brings you peace. And not your wealth, not, um, not our uh, status, not, not anything else in this life. With Jesus, you have no missing peace. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to earth to provide what was missing in my life. Fill me with the peace only you can give today. In your precious name I pray. Amen. Hey, it's Pastor Mike. Uh, thanks so much for listening today. If you enjoy this podcast but want to go even deeper in your faith, I want to invite you to check out all the great content that we put out here at Time of Grace. Um, the easiest way for you to do that, and the way that I personally do that, is by signing up for the Time of Grace email. I might be biased, <laughs> but I think the Time of Grace team does a great job putting all into one email, a written devotion, a video devotion, a blog post, podcasting options, it's the way that I love to start my day. And if you want to go deeper with Jesus, it's a great way to start yours too. Just look for the link in the episode notes to sign up. And thanks for your support.